Okay. So now it's the, 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 our last two presentation. First, thank you, children. Please. Beer is coming soon. Who's <laughs> coming? So, it's my honor and privilege to present to you Nina Emery that will give us a, a talk called How and Why to Be a Metaphysical Naturalist, which would be probably a good answer to Anjan's <laughs> presentation this morning. You have the floor. Thanks. So, I'm going to be old school and talk from a handout. I'm not positive that there are enough, but I, it's on my website too, so... If anybody would rather have a digital copy. <clears throat> you can get it there, or if there aren't enough. Apologies for that. OK. And um, the other thing to say about this handout is that this is the handout that I use when I'm giving a full hour length version of this talk. So I'm not going to get to everything that's actually on the handout. But I thought I'd circulate it anyway. And then if anyone has questions. I'd be happy to, um, to take questions on anything on the handout. And my email is also at the top of the handout. And I'd be happy to hear from you after the talk. OK, so this talk is about a book that I recently finished. And the book is about a puzzle that um, has been with me since I was a lowly undergraduate student and was studying both physics and philosophy, and in particular, had uh, the experience of learning about relativity at the same time in my physics class at the same time that I was studying some metaphysics of time in a philosophy class. And being, as I think many of us uh, have also experienced, being confused about what the relationship was between those two projects. And to some extent, I've been confused about that ever since and trying to figure it out. And uh, this is my recent best attempt. So the the topic that I'm interested in is naturalism. I define naturalism really broadly. So what it means to be a naturalist is just about metaphysics, specifically, is to think that when you're designing or defending your metaphysical theories, then you should be respectful of our best science. OK, so there is going to be a whole bunch of different varieties of naturalism, depending on things like how strong the respecting relation is, and then also on um, the nature of the relata in that relation. So in particular, the aspect of our best science that we're going to be respecting. So I am focused on two kinds of naturalism and the relationship between them. So two specific theories that are part of this broader group. There is many other specific versions of the broader group. So if you're wondering, like, how does my favorite kind of naturalism relate to the two on the handout? That's an interesting question, but it might just be that it's another one. OK. Um, so the first, the two kinds of naturalism are content naturalism and methodological naturalism. Content naturalism is the view that metaphysicians should not accept theories that conflict with the content of our best scientific theories. I'm going to say more about how I understand that in just a second. Um, and methodological naturalism is the view that when we're choosing between candidate theories, metaphysicians should, whenever possible, use the same methodology that scientists use. So what I'm going to argue for is that these two theses are related to one another in an important way. But I just want to start um, by noting a couple of caveats about them. <laughs> The first is that um, it's compatible, I think, especially in this context. We're sensitive to the idea that the content of our best science might not be very obvious, either because what counts as our best science isn't fixed, or in some cases, we think we have a handle on, in some sense, what our best science is, but there's diverging views about what the content of those theories is. So I'm very sympathetic to that. Content naturalism is compatible with having that view. You just have to think that sometimes it's hard to know what metaphysicians should do because it's hard to know what the contents of our best scientific theories are. Or if you think um, sometimes the content of our best scientific theories is indeterminate and you're a content naturalist, then you'll think sometimes it's indeterminate what metaphysicians should do. Okay. Um, 
a caveat on methodological naturalism. So similarly, I take it that methodological naturalism leaves open the, or it's compatible with the claim that the methodology of science sometimes leaves open, or maybe even often leaves open, metaphysical debates. So it might be that the methodology of science, we should be, um, we should, as metaphysicians, try to use that methodology, but it just doesn't settle very many of our metaphysical questions. Okay. That's, you could have that view as a methodological naturalist. I think that methodological naturalism will have significant impacts on how we should do metaphysical theorizing, and there's a bunch of argument that I can give for that, but just as a preview, the rough idea is going to be that scientific methodology involves the use of what I call extra empirical reasoning. And in paradigm cases, this is going to be appeals to extra empirical principles. So things like all else being equal, we ought to choose the simplest theory. Or all else being equal, we ought to choose the theory that's most explanatorily powerful. Heads up, I don't actually think that either of those ones that I just mentioned is a part of scientific methodology, but those are sort of like the paradigm examples that philosophers like to give. And the thought is that um, these kinds of extra empirical principles, if they in fact are a part of scientific methodology, will be the kinds of things that can impact metaphysical debates. Okay, so maybe our data doesn't settle, you know, whether we should believe in concrete possible worlds or something like that, but, it, but a principle like all else being equal, equal, choose the simplest theory might well have bearing on that metaphysical debate. Okay, so the central thesis of my talk is that content naturalism and methodological naturalism are linked in the following way. You shouldn't accept content naturalism unless you also accept methodological naturalism. And I think that this is going to have significant ramifications um, for contemporary metaphysics for the following reasons. One, I take it that almost all contemporary metaphysicians are content naturalists. Okay. So I think that there's a few different ways to bring this out. One is by focusing on scientific theories that we, um, we have all like fully internalized. So if you think about why is it that no philosophers spend a lot of time thinking about the Aristotelian view that there's only four elements? Answer, it obviously conflicts with our best chemistry. Or why doesn't anybody take seriously this thing that Descartes apparently said, which was um, that the Earth was a cooled star? Again, completely incompatible with what we know about both astronomy and geology, I take it. So we don't take that view seriously. Um, ancient Buddhism said that the, the heart is the seat of consciousness. Okay, Again, something that we don't take seriously at all. all right, so why don't we take those views seriously as philosophers? Why don't we even spend time thinking about them? Because we have fully internalized content naturalism, and those are scientific views that we take, are decisive, take to be decisively settled. You don't see any discussion of those in the philosophical literature precisely because we take them to be uh, decisively settled. The kinds of things you do see discussed in the philosophical literature are cases where there's at least some controversy. Okay, so my favorite, we can talk about other examples in the Q&A, and I love to hear other examples from, from you all. My favorite example of this um, goes back to the debate that I mentioned at the very beginning of the talk, um, the debates over presentism and the compatibility of presentism as a view about the metaphysics of time with special relativity. Okay, so the rough idea behind that thought is that if you think that the present moment is the only moment that exists, then you have to think that there is some objective difference between what's present, what's past, and what's future. And on a very plausible reading of relativity theory, it doesn't allow for any objective distinction between what's present, past, and future. So on a relatively straightforward reading of the science, there's a conflict between the scientific theory and a metaphysical position. And therefore, the content naturalist would think that if they accept that the um, scientific theory says what I say that it does, then they're going to think you can't accept that metaphysical theory. Now, you will see debate about this in the literature. I have played a part in this debate. The reason why there's room for debate is because it's actually a little bit tricky to pull out the relevant content from the scientific theory. So in particular, you can distinguish between the parts of relativity that are empirically supported, 
um, by things like the Mickelson-Morley experiments, which show that there's pairs of events such that in different reference frames, um, such that in some reference frames they happen at the same time and in some reference frames they don't. That's the empirical content of the theory. But then the theory also relies on this extra empirical principle, which is that no reference frame is privileged. And there's no data that supports that principle. That's sort of an additional claim. And the question is, the reason why there's still controversy over whether or not uh, we can be presentists is because there's controversy over the status of that little extra empirical bit of the theory. <laughs> okay, so again, the thought is that whether we're talking about debates that we don't even see show up in the literature because everybody has accepted them, or debates where there's some controversy, everybody who's taking parts in, the, in these debates, I think pretty much, is a content naturalist. So if you could establish definitively that special relativity says there's no privileged present moment, and you don't want to be a relativist about what exists, mm -hmm. then you can't be a presentist. OK, so again, I'm arguing for this link between content and methodological naturalism. Right now, I'm in a little bit of the talk where I'm trying to convince you that the link is going to have substantive results. The first part of that is saying everybody's a content naturalist, almost mm -hmm. everybody. Somebody's going to give me an example of a non-content naturalist, and we can, we can debate it. Um, I welcome that. Pretty much everybody is a content naturalist. Um, at the same time, I don't think that metaphysicians have really internalized what methodological, what kinds of consequences methodological naturalism will have. There's often these sort of like gestures toward methodological naturalism in the literature, especially when philosophers are trying to, especially when metaphysicians are trying to like defend metaphysics. They'll be like, oh, we're just doing the thing that scientists do. Like, we choose the simplest, most explanatorily powerful theory. Quine said things like this. Ted Sider says things like this. Lori Paul says things like this. So there's like a, a rough gesture in the direction of methodological naturalism. But I don't think anybody has um, done the work to really try to draw out what exactly the extra empirical principles are that function in scientific methodology and then <coughs> apply them in metaphysical debates. So I think that there's really interesting work to be done there, and it has the potential to, to um, really shape the kinds of views we take in metaphysics. OK. Um, let me see. OK. So on the second page of the handout, there's um, the argument for that content methodology link. I'm not going to go through this in detail. I'm just going to give you the basic version. I find the basic version really convincing. Um, and in the book, I go through all the little versions, uh, persistifications of it in agonizing detail. Um, so I'm not going to do that today. The basic version is just um, what's at the top of that second page. So the idea is there's no reason to respect the content of your best scientific theories if you don't also respect the methodology that produced those theories. Another way to gloss that is there's no reason to be a content naturalist unless you're also a methodological naturalist. And that's just the link, right? So the thought is, if one doesn't think that the methodology that produces scientific theories tracks the metaphysical truth, the truth about how things are metaphysically, then um, why do you care if your favorite metaphysical theory conflicts with our best science? Um, those scientific theories were produced by a methodology that, however excellent at producing science, we've just suggested isn't reliable when it comes to producing metaphysics. Okay? So that's the rough idea. Why would you take scientific theories to constrain your metaphysics if you don't think the methodology that produced those scientific theories has a bearing on the metaphysical truth? Um, okay, so you'll notice that I've been using the word truth here on the metaphysical truth or whether science tells you the truth about how things are. So there's going to be a bunch of further details in the background about whether, the, whether and the extent to which you're a realist about science and a realist about metaphysics. On the handout, um, in fact, in order to like put the, premise in prem put the argument in premise conclusion form, you have to like take a stand on what the aim of um, uh, what the aim of metaphysical theorizing is. But the good news is it ends up the same way regardless of which stand you take. So I just did one on the handouts. I think um, you'll probably be able to discern how the argument would change if you 
um, thought, for instance, that the point of metaphysical theorizing is like to come up with theories that are useful for creatures like us or something like that. Um, I have strong realist tendencies, as you can probably tell by my snarky tone of voice, um, <laughs> but I don't think anything turns on my realism here. Okay, so this is the argument for the content methodology link. I'll warn you that a lot, so I welcome objections to the argument. I'll warn you that a lot of objections are really kind of pseudo objections because they're either, the upshot of the objection is either we should um, reject the, the consequent of the conditional, which is totally fine by me, just reject the antecedent too, right? Or we have to accept the antecedent of the conditional, which is also fine by me, you just have to accept the consequent too, okay? So uh, a true objection to the argument would identify a reason for being a content naturalist i.e. accepting the antecedent without also accepting the consequence. So sometimes people will say things like, um, uh, say things like, well, the methodology of science, that leads to truth in the domain of science. But like, why should we think that that methodology leads to truth in the domain of metaphysics? That's a different thing. And that, to which I say, great, I think if that's your view, you shouldn't be a methodological naturalist. You also shouldn't be a content naturalist. Because when you have some metaphysical theory that you um, favor, and somebody says, wait, it conflicts with science, you should say, yeah, because you created that, we created that scientific theory using um, a methodology that was designed to reveal the, the um, truth or whatever about the scientific domain. And here, I'm talking about the metaphysical domain. That's a separate thing, okay? So that's a good example of an objection that I don't think is actually an objection to the argument. It's just taking a stand on what to do in light of the link. Um, okay, so I'll give you um, a hint. Probably some of you are thinking about this already. I'll be happy to talk about this in q and A. I I think that one of the only real objections to this argument is if you think that there is no such thing as standard scientific methodology. So if you think that that just isn't something that refers to anything in the world, then it's not clear exactly what um, is going to happen to the argument. Sometimes I get in a mood where I say in response to that position, yeah, great. Again, you should not be a content naturalist because you think that our best scientific theories were produced by well, I don't know what you think they were produced by because you don't think there's standard scientific methodology. Sorry? Produced by anything. Yeah. So, okay, so that's one kind of response. I think often what people have in mind is just a really fine-grained view about methodology. So there isn't a single scientific methodology. There's like scientific methodology in this context, scientific methodology in this context, and so on and so forth. That, I think, is a really interesting objection, and I'd be happy to talk more about it in the Q&A. Let me just give you a preview of one, a couple things you might say in response to that. So one thing you might say, and um, this is sort of hearkening back to my physics roots, is you might just like take a stand and say, the real scientific methodology is the one that gives us fun, the fundamental, um, the one that shows up in fundamental physics. All the rest is like, I don't know, the stuff we do to, I don't know. Okay. So you might take a stance on that and just try to pick out one of the methodologies as like the real one, and then that's the one you should also follow as a metaphysical naturalist. Um, I don't actually myself take that stance, and I just am a little bit tempted toward it. Um, the other thing that I think that you can do is you can end up with a context-dependent metaphysics alongside your context-dependent science. Okay, so the thought is that if you think there's a bunch of different kinds of scientific methodology, then those methodologies may well generate a bunch of different metaphysical views, all of which you should adopt. So like a toy version of this is you might think, oh, there's like the methodology of physics, there's a methodology of um, chemistry, this is like the layer cake, um, even more sort of, uh, yeah, an even more simplistic version of the layer cake. A methodology of biology, maybe there's like a methodology of psychology or something like that. And then instead of just having one thing, metaphysics, right, you're going to have the metaphysics of physics, which is generated using the methodology of physics. The metaphysics of chemistry, which is generated using the methodology of chemistry. The metaphysics of biology, and so on and so forth. Okay? So that's usually, I think, when people have in mind the idea that 
the methodology of science is context dependent. They have something much more sophisticated than the layer cake um, in mind, but that's the move will be the same to adapt to <coughs> adapt a context dependent metaphysics in the same kind of way as you have a context dependent science. Okay. Um, so that's all I'm going to say about the argument. I want to say a little bit about um, applying the link. Can you tell me how much time I have? Oh, you still have uh, 11 minutes. 11 minutes. So long. Okay. So the third page of um, the handout is talking about applying the link and why I think that the link will prove substantive. So my main commitment is just to the conditional claim itself. Personally, I think the default view for metaphysicians ought to be to accept the antecedent and the consequent of the conditional claim. Um, I'll say a little bit more about rejecting the consequent if I remember right at the end, because I think that that's an interesting option. But I think that the default ought to be to accept the antecedent and the consequent, just for the very basic reason that I think science has been very successful in putting forward theories about what the world is like, and also that I think there isn't a very clear demarcation between the scientific and the metaphysical domain. So it's hard to, um, to explain why science has been so successful with no demarcation, no clear demarcation there if you're not going to end up being a content naturalist. I also think it's worth noting that content naturalism doesn't require that you accept scientific realism. It does require that you have a certain kind of congruence between your view about what the aims of science are and your view about what the aims of metaphysics are. So one really good reason to not be a content naturalist um, and to respond to the link by rejecting both the, the antecedent and the consequent of the conditional is if you are a pragmatist about science but a realist about metaphysics. So you think that what scientists are doing is like coming up with, now my snarky voice again, um, uh, theories that are easy for creatures to us creatures like us to use when we're navigating a world like this or something like that. But what metaphysics is doing is trying to reveal the deep truth about objective mind independent reality. So if you've got that kind of discrepancy in um, <coughs> what you think the aims of science are versus what you think the aims of metaphysics are, then I don't think you should be a content naturalist. But again, I also think you don't think you should be a, met a methodological naturalist, right? So the link is still there. It's just one way of responding to it. Um, there's going to be a bunch of um, further moves here if you're more, if you have a more sophisticated view about realism, like the um, some of the options that Anjan brought up earlier today. Okay, so I'm not going to talk about any of those. If anybody wants to ask how they work out, I'd be happy to talk about it in the Q and A. Um, okay, so again, I think that the default response to accepting the link should be or the default response to the link, which everybody should ex accept, should be accepting the antecedent, which will also mean that you should be a methodological naturalist. And here's a more sophisticated take than what I said earlier on why we should think that methodological naturalism is going to be widely impactful. So I'll give a general argument, um, and then I'll also point to a few specific cases. So the structure of the book at this point is, again, a general argument, and then three case studies where I actually try extracting a methodological principle from science and applying it to a debate in metaphysics. So to some extent, the proof is sort of in the cases. But I think you can say something, I can say something general about how this works as well. Um, so the rough idea is just the reason why we should think that methodological naturalism is going to impact debates in metaphysics is first step. Our scientific commitments are regularly underdetermined by the data that scientists collect. Second step, when this happens, scientists often choose which commitments to take on using various extra empirical principles. Third step, these kinds of extra empirical principles are the kinds of principles that can be used to settle metaphysical debates. So regarding that first claim, the underdetermination claim, especially for those of you who are familiar with those debates, 
For what it's worth, I take both actual historical cases of underdetermination and also what are sometimes called, sort of with scare quotes, mere philosophical cases of underdetermination to be relevant. So philosophical cases tend to be like the kinds of cases that inspire skepticism. So what if we're in a simulation and everything will, all the data will be exactly the same, but the underlying metaphysical reality will be different. Um, and for historical cases, I think examples include things like um, the classic heliocentric versus geocentric model of the uh, solar system, a case where we had multiple empirically, uh, multiple theories that were equally well, um, sorry, that were un where a choice between them was underdetermined by the data that scientists collect. Um, a second case, I think, is Einstein mm -hmm. choosing special relativity over a, um, a variant of that view that included a privileged reference frame. I mentioned that earlier. And then there's a bunch of other examples in the, in the literature mm -hmm. on actual scientific choices in cases where the, um, the choice is underdetermined by the data. Regarding the second point of this argument that I'm making here, I prefer this way of thinking about extra empirical reasoning that I've been using so far as involving these extra empirical principles. So principles of the form, although I don't actually like this one, when all else is equal to the simplest theory. I think that there are other ways of thinking about how extra empirical reasoning comes in. So one way you can think about it is in determining what the data actually is. So you can say um, the data can be the data that is used to um, decide between theories can itself be more or less sort of theory laden. Another way of thinking about extra empirical reasoning is using confirmation theory. But my claim is that any way of approaching um, these cases of underdetermination is going to involve some kind of extra empirical reasoning and that's going to show up in the, that's going to be the kind of thing that at least in principle can impact mm -hmm. metaphysical debates. Okay, so that was a quick version of the overall, the sort of general argument that methodological naturalism will be impactful. In my last five minutes, I'll just point to some of the specific cases that I have in mind. So on the fourth page of the handout, um, I list three specific principles that I think um, are part of standard scientific methodology. The first is this thing I call the pattern explanation principle. So this says that when you're choosing between competing empirically adequate theories, if one is explanatorily adequate and the others are not, then you should choose a theory that's explanatorily adequate, even if the theory involves the introduction of some type of entity that's metaphysically weird or novel. Okay. What I mean by explanatorily explanatorily adequate here is that it doesn't leave patterns without an explanation. That's why it's called the pattern explanation principle. So I think you can find a bunch of cases in science where scientists are willing to introduce weird or novel entities precisely because otherwise we'd leave a pattern without an explanation. I think you can, um, you can look at the introduction of the electromagnetic fields uh, by Faraday in the 19th century, you can think about Pauli's introduction of the neutrino, you can think about the contemporary introduction of dark energy and cosmology. So I think there's lots of scientific cases like that. Um, and then I think that that specific principle is going to have a consequence for certain debates in metaphysics. So the one that I focused on is a debate about the nature of laws. So I think that this view, the pattern explanation principle, has the result that we ought to endorse what I call a governing conception of laws, which, unless things get really weird, is going to end up being a non human conception of laws. So we should think of laws as some things that explain patterns in the phenomena. And if you're like, well, what kind of thing are laws? Aren't those weird? I'm a human, I don't want them. Um, then the thought is, you're not allowed to point out how metaphysically weird or novel laws are because that's irrelevant if um, we would be leaving a pattern without an explanation. The pattern explanation principle says it's okay to introduce metaphysically weird or novel things if you need them to play a certain explanatory role. Okay, so that's just one, on this fourth page of the handout, I go through three of the methodological principles and three things that I think follow. What I just gave you is just one example. <laughs> Um, but since I'm going to get shown the bomb really soon, I will um, just mention some of the kind of loose threads that 
this very brief <coughs> overview of the of um, the book leaves open. So one of the threads is about um, is the one that I mentioned earlier, which is how is the content methodology link complicated by different views that you might have about the relations between different sciences. So I gave a little preview of the kinds of things I want to say in response to that, but I think that that is um, work that needs to continue to be developed. The second um, loose thread that I haven't said anything about today is, how, is the question of how plausible it is to respond to the content methodology link by rejecting content naturalism. So I think that this is um, really interesting and deserving of further scrutiny. I think that metaphysics would look really different than it currently does if we actually were not um, beholden to content naturalism at all. And to be totally honest, I'm not really sure what it would look like. Um, but I'd be happy to talk more about what I see as some of the options there. Um, and then the, um, the final loose thread is just that I talked through here one application of methodological naturalism, and on the handout there's two more. But I take it that this is all just like proof of concept. So the idea is that there's a bunch of further work. I'm trying to model what I think that work should look like. Um, but that work is going to go well beyond anything that's, um, that I'm doing in this particular case. Thanks. Oh, oh boy. Okay. Oh, uh, <laughs> people will be unhappy. No, please. Mm -hmm. I raise my hand. So usually, so again, yeah, my, that's true. You were the first. Yeah. My email is this on the, uh, the handout, so, so anybody who doesn't get a question is welcome. Okay. <laughs> Let's start with you. Thank you, Nina. That was amazing. I can't wait to read the book. I am one of the people who would reject content naturalism. Okay. So, yeah. So, so, I just have a question regarding the reason you give why you think it should be the default view. Yeah. So, you think, you say because science has been incredibly successful in putting forward theories about what the world is like. And then, just down there, you say content naturalism doesn't require one to accept scientific realism. But isn't accepting that uh, science is putting theories about what the world is like is a form of realism? So, what's, so uh, to me, the reason to adopt it is not clear. It's just mm -hmm. ju Just one more thing, yeah. Yep. Also, regarding the examples you mentioned um, earlier in the talk about why we don't talk about Aristotelian elements uh -huh. or um, the Buddhist consciousness in the heart. I don't think it's because of we're content naturalists. I think because these things are not, these subjects are not part of philosophy anymore. So these parts of subjects now belong to natural sciences, and natural sciences says otherwise. But that's not to say that uh, metaphysically, um, that's not to say that we're doing naturalistic metaphysics in this case. We're not being na content naturalists. We're just, you know, doing science without mm -hmm. any metaphysics whatsoever, and science says something else. Okay. So, as metaphysicians, this is just a domain that's far removed from the studies we do now. At the time of Aristotle, it was not, it wasn't obviously. So, mm -hmm. I think this is why we're not mentioned, we're not talking about these things, not because necessarily we, we're content naturalists, but because, uh, you know, it's just another domain whatsoever. It's mm -hmm. just another domain. Yeah. So, um, so I'd love to hear more about what you, not actually, but <laughs> in principle, I'd love to hear more about, um, because I want to hear the other questions, um, about what you take to demarcate the domains. But I also just want to disagree with you. So I think, for instance, like the example of, um, the, so traditional um, Buddhist thought said that the heart is the seat of consciousness. Um, so I think as philosophers, we talk about consciousness all the time. We talk about consciousness, does it supervene or is it grounded by our brain states? We don't talk about whether or not conscious experience might be supervening, supervening on or grounded by our heart states. Why not? Because uh, we all take it to be off, that option to be off the table. So I just, I, in, and in general, I think like the kinds of questions that get taken up by philosophers, for instance, um, in the time case, we've got something that where the domains are clearly overlapping, um, but we take the, the positions that we can adopt to be constrained by, by science. 
So yeah, so you said that you would be happy to reject content naturalism or interest in that option. I think that's that's really interesting, and I don't think it gets discussed enough. And it'd be it's worth. Um, I hope that the literature includes some more like fleshing out of those options. I'll just point to one really important, I think, distinction between two different types of uh, two different approaches you might have if you're rejecting content naturalism. So one is a view that says that there are, are genuine conflicts between science and metaphysics. And usually this f gets followed up by saying, um, but it's OK, because metaphysics is just doing something different. So I think that like the French and McKenzie toolbox view of metaphysics, um, or a philosophy of science, which you can also just apply it to metaphysics, um, is something like this. So the idea is like there's conflicts between science and metaphysics. That's cool because we're not actually trying to get at the truth with metaphysics. We're trying to just like generate lots of concepts for the toolbox that we might someday use. <coughs> a different way of rejecting content naturalism is to actually say there aren't any conflicts at all. So like all the content is relativized. Um, so I don't think this is what what um, most metaphysicians think because if they did, then when somebody said you can't be a presentist. Because special relativity says there's no privilege reference frame. They would just say, special relativity says, according to science, there's no privilege reference frame. I'm saying, according to metaphysics, there is. And only the things that are present according to that reference frame exist. So that's one way to not be a content, or to reject content naturalism, is just to relativize all of the scientific content um, and all the metaphysical content to these separate domains. Um, so I'll be curious to see which view you develop. So, unfortunately, I will have to arbitrarily, because <laughs> that's the only one I saw first. So I'm sitting on the side. Sorry. So I'll go. I'll go. I'll go, I'll go arbitrarily on my left because there's too much right wing recently. <laughs> Already, okay. So go. Fair enough. I can't I believe that worked. <laughs> for the question. So just. Um, did I get it right? So the, this extra empirical, um, the, the scientific methodology we'll talk about, just simplicity. So this extra empirical reasoning, right? It's not it's, simplicity, though. I was just using um, that as an yeah, example. Yeah, explanatory power, elegance, yeah. and this kind of, this kind of meta um, uh, theoretical um, um, properties, right? Can, so can I just clarify, and then, then you can ask your question? Sure. So I'm using those to point out the kinds of principles that I think are going to play a role. But I'm not committed to any of those in particular. So a more careful examination of science, I think, turns up at least the three that are on the handout, okay, which are related, I think, at least to explanation. But I'm not, crucially, I don't want to be doing what, for instance, like Lori Paul, who I think is wonderful, does, where she just says, it's some combination of simplicity, elegance, explanatory power. I'm not doing that. So I'm saying, it's, it is some specific principles of that type. Let's go find out what they are. And I've given three. All right, but, yeah. but not, so let's say, not the, the, the um, observation experimental method, right? It's not what you're, you're uh, aiming for. You, you don't want to claim that metaphysics should adopt the experimental method, right? Because metaphysics can do experiments in the first place, so it can do that, right? So you, you're only pointing at um, meta theoretical <coughs> properties, right? But one would say, well, these are, I mean, we can call this scientific methodology, but it's really theory methodology that concerns all theory, and that, that's not about science. Uh, mm -hmm. So one could also go the other way around. One could say, if you accept uh, a scientific methodology in that, uh, um, um, conceived in this sense uh, as uh, meta theoretical properties, then one should accept. Uh, content uh, naturalism, right? You reverse the arrow. Yes. And, and uh, I mean, it seems to me to be a rather weak claim because that's the, that's the claim that metaphy metaphysics uh, tries to build theories and that these are virtues of theories that metaphysics should adopt them. But it's not because we are content naturalists, it's just because these are virtues of theories and mm -hmm. we want our theories to be virtuous. So mm -hmm. we're not, we're not in taking that from science. Um, OK, so I think that you could definitely have an independent argument based on um, like your background for uh, epistemology for any of the principles that I'm putting forward. And that's, I'm fine with there mm -hmm. being such arguments. 
I just think that there is also a way of arriving at these principles without actually having to go into that deeper <coughs> at all, which is to say, you all are content naturalists. Well, most of you are content naturalists. Um, so you are committed to the same methodology, using the same methodology that scientists use, and this is part of that methodology. So it's not that I don't think you can give a, a different underlying epistemic justification, but I think that this is uh, a different way of arriving at uh, like some normative force for those principles. And then as to the question of like, will it be substantive, um, I think that the three principles that are here, if you agree with me that those are principles of scientific theory choice, they settle mm -hmm. substantive debates in metaphysics that are currently open and controversial. So I do yeah. think it's substantive, but, but maybe you just um, agree with me about those debates anyway. I was asking because I, it seems to be that most metaphysicians also adopt these principles. So you can say that most of the metaphysicians, they adopt content naturalism, but not um, um, methodological naturalism. But it seems to me that if we, uh, if we conceive methodological naturalism in this sense, namely as meta-theoretical properties, then everybody agrees with that. And everybody's already using it. So I think that, that if you uh, asked um, metaphysicians, this is what methodological naturalism means. Do you think we should adopt it? I think a lot of them will say yes, but I think almost none of them have thought through what the actual principles are that are part of standard scientific methodology, or even if they're committed to their being standard scientific methodology. So in that way, it's substantive. Here's one other way to look at it. So maybe less so in this context, but in a lot of philosophical contexts, metaphysics gets divided into, there's like naturalistic metaphysics and um, a priori metaphysics, where I don't mean anything about um, the methodology, I mean the content. So it's like, if you're gonna work in philosophy of time, you start to do that as a grad student, at some point somebody's gonna be like, hey, you have to know your physics if you're gonna work on philosophy of time. But if you're working on like questions about the special composition question, it's cool if you don't know your science, like that's just all the, that's just like pure metaphysics over there. So if I'm right about methodological naturalism, there isn't that division. Right? Because these extra empirical principles are just as likely to apply to something, to a concept that like shows up in our best scientific theories like time, as they are to something like composition or pick mm -hmm. whatever your favorite a priori uh, topic is. So let's thank our speaker. Mm -hmm.